The first time I watched Sado, I was about 16 years old. I really loved it. I finally revisited the movie a couple of weeks ago. I'm much more sensitive towards violence in media nowadays than I was back then. And now, after this rewatch, I finally understand why Sado makes into so many lists of most disturbing of all time. And I think the uncomfortable experience I had upon this rewatch is much closer to the intended experience than the one I had back then. So, let's talk about it. Welcome to Vanessa Jupiter's sitting room. Today I am revisiting Salo, or the 120 Days of Sodom, as an adult. As a preface, I'll be using some clips of the movie that contain suggestion of violence, but I did my best to not include anything too graphic. Content warnings. This video contains discussions of fictional sexual violence, fictional torture, Fictional sexual violence targeted at minors, fictional torture targeted at minors, body fluids, excrements, fictional consumption of body fluids and excrements, how these things relate to BDSM and kink, teenage sexuality. I will not discuss the ethics of BDSM. I will not discuss the ethics of age play or consensual non-consent nor will I discuss the ethics of the production of a movie such as Salo or The 120 Days of Sodom. Be mindful of the type of content you consume. Part 1. Teenagers When I was a teen watching Salo, I could easily put myself in the place of the victims and have the fantasy that I was being the target of sexual abuse. That's not the most comfortable viewing experience, sure, but it's an uncomfortable experience with no moral dilemma. As an adult who doesn't like to age play, identifying with the teens isn't really easy and identifying with the adults is a moral nightmare. This is a contradiction that I think is key to the intended experience of watching the movie. I firmly believe that we should be having more conversations about teenage sexuality. Some teenagers can be very horny without having a lot of life experience, which makes them potential targets of abuse that are very specific to teenagers. Ignoring that can lead to discussions about the abuse specifically targeted at teenagers to lack the nuance that it needs. Dove vai? There is one scene in particular that struck me upon this rewatch. Everyone is in a room where a wedding ceremony just took place. The teens are all naked. One of the libertines, the duke, starts going around and kissing, touching, grabbing, cheeks, shoulders, chests, and then he kisses one of the teens on the lips. And that victim smiles and kisses the duke back. This might have been the most uncomfortable scene for me to rewatch. This man is just going around kissing naked teenagers. It's repulsive to a degree that I find really difficult to match. Salo has a lot happening on the sidelines. We get a distinct feeling that every single person in the movie is a character who's going through their own journey and sometimes we get little glimpses of their stories. The Duke and this teen he kissed are seen together again a couple of scenes later. They are sitting at a bench and the way that they kissed then seems tender. It almost seems consensual. It isn't, of course. The victim was captured and being, is being held against his will at the risk of being dragged into a psychology discourse rabbit hole. I'll say it's probable the victim is experiencing Stockholm Syndrome. As an adult viewer, the way the victim responds to the abuse is uncomfortable precisely because I can see it for what it is. Not for one second do I forget the abuse that's being inflicted upon him or the way in which his agency and his ability to consent have been removed. Or the fact that he's a teenager kissing a grown man. To my adult eyes, there's nothing even remotely okay about this exchange. But I remember being a 16 year old who liked the idea of being sexual with adults. For a teenager, the idea of being taken into a den of sexual pleasures, even if it's done without consent, 
even if the sexual pleasure is at their expense, even if the sexual acts are repulsive at multiple points, even if they, as teens, know themselves that this isn't something that they actually desire, that it's just a fantasy, the idea of being taken there can still be enticing. It's the fantasy of being taken into an orgy, a thing teens usually don't have access to. The fantasy of having adults paying attention to them, of having adults desire them. The movie has other moments like this, where what's happening is obviously not desirable, but it's an undesirable that might seem attractive to someone who doesn't have access to anything like it. What I'm trying to say is, Salo may be hot for teenagers, and that is valid. <laughs> Part two. Aesthetics. Salo uses an aesthetic that's very intellectual. There's even a bibliography in the opening credits. I'm using the word aesthetic on purpose here. I don't think that there's anything that makes a movie that looks like Salo to be inherently more valuable than a movie that looks like, say, Saw. This intellectual vibe has little to do with the actual content. Not nothing, and I'll get to where I think the aesthetics affect the content the most in a second, but little. The, mu the movie has classic music being played on the piano throughout. I'll go ahead and call the cinematography and the setting very art house. The violence doesn't feel gratuitous. I'm always affected by films that include extreme violence, yes, but the perceived dissonance of a film that features extreme violence but feels like it's serious, like it's important, like it's something that I should be paying attention to. It feels contradictory and it renders the viewing experience even more difficult for me. Let's talk about gays. The moments that the camera chooses to show us what the libertines are seeing, I'll call this the libertine gays, are few. And even fewer of those include sexual acts. In fact, let's talk about one of those few shots. One of the storytellers proposes that two of the teens be masturbated in order to find out if they can orgasm, which the libertines agree to. Two victims are brought to another large room and the libertines watch them be masturbated. The camera does take the perspective of the libertines, but they are all the way on the other side of this large room and there's nothing the audience can really understand beyond two couples of naked people doing something. Taking a step back from the libertine gaze for a second, another moment that I really like is the one where the duke forces one of the victims to eat poop. Not only because it's disgusting and awful, but also because that scene is shot out of focus. Yes, one of the most iconic moments of Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom is out of focus for the most part, as if to make sure the movie isn't interested in looking at the victims for long. Most of the time though, things like this scene are more common. We know exactly what's happening. The libertines are sexually assaulting teens. Teens that happen to be just off screen. This moment, very deliberately, lives the victims out of the frame. Merci, votre excellence. The choice of cinematography is either wide shots or close-ups on faces for the most part. Let's talk about each of these. First, the close-ups. A close-up on a face would rarely be considered an erotic frame, but isn't it sometimes? A couple of times we get close-ups on the faces of the libertines as they are experiencing pleasure derived from the abuse they are inflicting on the victims. And sometimes, looking at the face of someone experiencing sexual pleasure is, you know, hot. The scene where the duke is being peed on is my golden example here. Maybe you're turned off by pee, so that's enough for the scene to lose any erotic read. But even for someone who likes pee, one second I'm looking at a close-up on the duke in ecstasy from getting peed on, and the next I'm looking at a close-up on the victim who looks like someone who's too shy to pee next to someone else in another stall in a public restroom. And that's where any potential erotic factor of such a scene is lost. Second, the wide shot. This is one that I find fascinating. The fact that so much of the movie uses wide shots, and the fact that the vast majority of the music and sound is diegetic, 
makes the movie amoral. While it's clear that the libertines are fascists and a central theme of the movie is the terror of fascism, that message is presented in a shockingly subtle and, dare I say, beautiful manner considering the actual content of the film. Stylus Substance has a video on this where Jay discusses one of the scenes near the end of the movie where we see a quick glimpse of humanity from the fascists. Link in the description. There are a couple of moments such as this, which I'd argue work in part because the cinematography is so detached. It's as if the film was saying, you can make up your mind on what you think of the story. I am only here to show you the events as they are without moralizing them. If you know the movie well, you probably considered my analysis of the libertine gaze in Salo to be incomplete at best and widely incompetent at worst. Don't worry, it's time to come back to it. The last 10 minutes of Salo feature an extremely obvious example of the camera using a character gaze. One of the libertines sits indoors on an upper floor in front of a window facing a backyard while the other libertines torture the victims. The libertine who's indoors looks at the tortures through binoculars, through a window, into the backyard, and we, the audience, only see the tortures like that, through binoculars, looking through a window into a backyard. Many of the contradictions that I've talked about are present in the setup. We're intimately connected with the fascist, and the viewing experience is rendered uncomfortable because that's the only character we have the option to relate to. The libertine is deriving pleasure from looking at the torture, but this looking couldn't be more detached than it is. And here we arrive explicitly in the BDSM conversation. These men are now voyeurs. Part 3. Dungeon. I already mentioned that I only saw the movie once when I was a teenager. A reaction I remember having was a little frustration that the heavy tortures only lasted 10 minutes in the end. Back then, I wanted to see more of that. Imagine my surprise then, when watching it again as an adult, I saw myself flinch, make noises, and refusing to look at some of the stuff again while I was pulling up clips to use in this video. I know it's just 10 minutes, but it's too much. I'm of the opinion that any body horror scene can be interpreted as a BDSM fantasy. If we put ourselves in the place of the victim, we are fantasizing about being tortured, which is part of BDSM. When I look at the layout of the Salo backyard, I can't help but feel like it looks a little bit like a BDSM dungeon. And even the tools that they use remind me of kink. There are candles, ropes, sharp objects, whips. Something that I found weird during my third rewatch of the movie. Good lord, what did I do to myself over the last couple of weeks? The torture scenes in the end don't really escalate. The second to last scene we see is one of the libertines whipping everyone around him. A moment like that could realistically happen as is in an actual dungeon, as long as everyone consented. Speaking of whipping, this isn't the first time we see that happening. There is a scene where the victims are put on leashes and they behave like dogs and they are fed like dogs. There's also a whipping scene there. It's obvious that this movie uses BDSM imagery. I imagine that 1970s Italy didn't have a thriving and well-known puppy community, but like, dog play is a really well-known kink. Okay, it's time to open up about something. Even as an adult, even with all the contradictions that I already laid out, there are some things in Salo that I can't help but find super hot. Degradation is a big fetish for me. The idea of having someone put me in my place by screaming angrily at me, especially if it's related to misbehavior, that's a big turn on. I've already touched on the poop eating scene, but I didn't say how that came to be. The Duke screams and degrades the victim in a way that I respond really well to. <laughs> the cycle of blood 
the last part of the movie actually starts with an incredible moment where three of the libertines put themselves in drag, arrive in a room where all the others are, and scream at them in anger. It's a really good degradation moment and it makes my little sub heart beat a little faster. If you ever decide to watch Salo with an eye out with what could be considered at least tangentially related to kink, you'll get something before the first 10 minutes are over. Angela! The general approach that the libertines have towards sexuality is something that I find interesting. They talk about masturbating different parts of the body. And it's nice to have a movie that talks about sex in a way that's not genital-centric. And that makes the movie even more complicated, doesn't it? Is Salo actually kink negative? The characters we see performing these activities are all pedophile rapist fascists, after all. Are we then to read the movie as a condemnation of all their behaviors? I don't think so, and I want to touch on the film's approach to religion. The libertines are extremely against any type of religious activity, and the religious activities that we see being performed that they punish are all Christian-based. Pasolini had a complicated view on religion and Christianity. The idea that he would have just given the libertines characteristics that he disagrees with would make their characterization painfully simplistic. I think that Pasolini knew what he was doing in regards to deviant sexualities. He made these characters be all sexually deviant, yes, but thanks to the detached tone, I'd argue that the movie succeeds in not making it a moral tale on kink either. At no point do I feel like this is wrong, therefore anything that looks like this at all is also wrong, but rather this is wrong when done like this. There's new ones here. And it all, of course, harkens back to my previous point about the movie being amoral. While getting ready for this video, I listened to the Girls Guts and Jalo podcast episode on Salo, where Annie Rose and JB Brager discuss the use of religion in the film much more in depth than I just did. And they also have a really different perspective on kink in relation to this film. I totally recommend it, link in the description too. Let's go back to the dungeon. <laughs> we witness all the depravities through the lenses of binoculars being used by a distant voyeur. And a lot of elements in the backyard look like they could be found in an actual BDSM dungeon. And everything gets perverted. The candles are used not as wax, but to burn penises. The ropes are used not to tie someone up, but to hang someone. The sharp objects are used not to tease or even lightly cut someone, but to remove someone's eye. The last one is especially interesting, because the victim smiles in the beginning of the scene. It's as if he thought it was going to be a game. And then there's a vivid sense of betrayal in his expression. One of the main advantages of going to a public dungeon is to perform these potentially dangerous activities in a place where it's safer, where third parties can easily jump in in case help is needed. Here, the rug is pulled from under us. We lose all sense of safety. In a scene that features multiple moments that I would usually consider super appealing in any other film, here nothing is even remotely palatable. It's all too much. But don't worry, the Duke stops looking through the binoculars for a few moments to check if the guard next to him is sexually aroused and is pleased to find out that he is. In the middle of the chaos of the tortures, the libertine is cold, detached, safe, in his own side of the window. The audience isn't afforded the detachment anymore. We have been pulled in. The voyeurs are more detached than we are. The voyeurs like what they are seeing more than we do. The voyeurs are hornier than us. And yet, they never Fuck.
Salah or the 120 days of Sodom is a difficult, uncomfortable, rough watch. Its subject matter might seem like the main reason why it's such a challenging film, but in truth, the entire audience experience is riddled with contradicting feelings and inputs. From the narrative to the framing to its relation to sex and sexuality, rendering the final result a much more intense experience than it would have been if it only presented as disturbing with no nuance. Thank you. Hi! Uh, so, thank you for watching. You may have noticed I didn't even attempt to answer the question on the title. The original thing that I wanted to call this video was BDSM, Teenage Sexuality and Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom, which is also a title that is much more aligned with what I usually title my videos. But uh, I knew that adding Teenage Sexuality to the title of my video which is about Salo, uh, would make a lot of people want to just like click on the video, dislike it, and just leave <laughs> without having seen any of it. I already think that a lot of people are going to do that. There's nothing I can do about it. Given that I didn't even try to answer the question, is Salo a kinky film? What do you think? Do you think that Salo is a kinky film? Do you think that Salo is a movie that like is about BDSM? How do you think Salo is about BDSM? Let me know in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, tag me on your Instagram stories, quote me on your dissertation thesis, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram, and I will see you next time. I'm really happy with this one. Hope you are too. Love, Vanessa Jupiter.